All right, good morning, everybody. Let's get started. Come on in, grab yourself a seat, grab yourself a hymn book. Let's uh, get our hymn books and get started with some songs together with page 11. I was thinking the other day about coming to church together, how great it is. It's, we're here for one purpose, to glorify God, but within that purpose, there's so many others, and for each person, it might look a little bit different. It might be, I'm here, and I need to, I need to grieve with somebody. I'm here, and I need to encourage somebody. I'm here, and I need comfort. I'm here, and I just really need to be reminded of, of God's word and what's true. So be thinking about, why am I here today? God, what do you have for me? What do I need? Let's stand together. Turn to page 11. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it Name of God's redeeming love Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from love full of God, he too from danger bond me with his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And then turn to the screen for verse 4. Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face, full arrayed in blood-washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy promises to pass. For I know thy power will keep me. Till I'm home with thee at last. Come, my Lord. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy promises to pass. For I know thy power will keep me. Till I'm home with thee at last. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, and the Father waits over the day to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that. Yeah. 
sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious songs of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet. shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glory gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore one more time in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore father we do thank you that we can be brought here today through christ's death for us and his resurrection for us, and that we, too, look forward to resurrection no matter what happens in this life and uh, what's happening day to day. We can look forward to that day when we're with you and you create new heavens and new earth and we're with you forever. Help us to live in light of that today, God. In Jesus' name. You can have a seat. Let's read the scripture together. We'll stand up and turn to Philippians chapter 4. This is the last section in the book. Come to the end, Philippians 4, starting at verse 15. Philippians 4, 15 through 23. And you, Philippians, yourselves... Know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right, now we'll receive the offer, and you can have a seat. Kent, could I have you pray? Sure. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time together as a family. We love you. And we uh, ask you to bless this time, bless this offering, and uh, for our people at home, bless them. We ask you to do this thing. Amen.
Thank you, Faith. Do any of you not know that song that she played? It's uh, His Eye is on the Sparrow. That's a sweet song. I haven't sang that in a while. His Eye is on the Sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let's stand together. Sing a song inspired by our friend Job. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name. Of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name. the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. 
Job said, should we accept good from God and not trouble? He's living in view of Mount Mercy. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, but His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. It's stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Amen. We thank you, God. Thank you for the chance to come here and to, to sing together to be united in our love and our, our just complete gratitude to you. Please bring us closer to the spot where Job was, and that we see you as everything we need, everything else as blessings on the side. Thank you for Jonathan as he comes and, and shares from Philippians again, and um, just help us to see, to listen, to understand what it means to us what you want us to change, how you want us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to come together as family. Thank you guys for the great music. And we are coming to the, book, the end of the book of Philippians. If you haven't been here, we've been in Philippians for a little while now. And uh, we, this is it. This is the last, the last bit. So if you're getting tired of it, then you're, you're good to go. You're on the final stretch. Hopefully you're not getting tired of it. In fact, I was thinking, I, my hope as I come up here and as I spend time studying is that, some, that God uses those words, right, to click, to, to work in all of our hearts. I get the advantage because I spend a lot more time in it than you do, but um, well, maybe. maybe you, you could spend a lot of time at home, and I hope you do, in, in the material. But I was just thinking, 
are there words that, that come to your mind or, or quick phrases as, as you think back over the last few months in Philippians? What are some things that have worked for you? Something God has, has blessed you with, maybe a reminder, maybe a challenge or, a, or an encouragement. Throw out a word or two of something you've heard in Philippians that, have been, that has worked for you. Rejoice. Rejoice. That's a big one, a good one. Yes. Pray without ceasing. Pray Being thankful. Get along. Get along. You, <laughs> unity has, has been one of the things that struck me. There, there's a theme of unity. Good. Anything else? Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Yes. Say it again. Citizenship. citizenship. And where in heaven? Good. Yes. Our citizenship is in heaven. Anything else? Press on and dwelling with the Lord. Something about a secret. The, the, the content secret. We, we, we're learning. We're working on that. Good. Good, good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad there's some concepts there. I was hoping that something is stuck with us as we spend the time together. Next week, I... I plan to um, talk a little bit about baptism as we look toward that in a few weeks. Um, and then after that, my, my hope is to go to the book of Ruth. So if you don't like Ruth, I'm sorry, you will learn to like Ruth. No, I, I, I'm sure you're good there, but I'm excited about it. Very different genre, and uh, it'll be a, be a good challenge for me, and a, I hope a good time together as we study that book. If you'd like to get a head start, it's in your Bible, so... Spend some time there. Uh, last time as we were together in Philippians, we saw Paul, as he began to express his thanks and, and he commended the Philippians, their church in, Philipp in Philippi, for the, the gift they had given to him, for their, their giving spirit, really, and, and their partnership in spreading the gospel with Paul. He then takes a rabbit trail, and here we have that idea of contentment. He gives testimony to his contentment. Um, it's not just an autobiographical um, expression, this is how I'm content, but it's a, it's a moment of teaching for all of us. Paul has called, he, he has learned what he has called the secret of being content. Somebody picked up on that. Have you learned that secret? And the expression there, the secret of being content, it, it means something along the lines, you can be on the outside, you can be on the inside, you can know it and you cannot know it. Some have it and some do not have it. Some have learned the secret of contentment, others have not. And it's more than just the knowledge of what it means to be content, right? But it's a position of contentment, it's a lifestyle, it's being satisfied in the Lord. And that includes whether you're in plenty or in want, whether your stomach is full or hungry, you have a little or a lot. And we, we saw that the key to the secret is in verse 13, I am able to do all things through him who gives me strength. All of these things I can have contentment through the strength of the Lord. So no matter what we face, maybe it's financial stress, maybe it's ill health, relational difficulties, you name it, in your life, he gives sufficient strength, the ability to be content, the, con the secret to contentment in all circumstances. So we do, we do well to learn that secret, to meditate on it, understand what it means, and learn it. Only through the power drawn th from Christ. Then if, you're, if your Bible's open, I hope it is there, look at verse 14, Paul comes off of that rabbit trail and he comes back around. We saw it last week. He says, you did well then by partnering with me, by giving to me in my need. And this is where we're going to pick it up today. The topic there of the Philippians partnering with Paul in the spreading of the gospel. Specifically by giving to his need financially. So let's ask God as we come to this last section to be with us. Father, thank you that you are with us. We ask that you would be working in our hearts as we look at your word. We, we take this time 
and other times, but this, this special time together to study your word and to learn of your truth. I pray that your truth would be spoken by the words I'll say and that you would work in our hearts no matter what to help us understand truth and apply truth in the, in the ways we need it in our lives. We need it in different ways. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul now, and again, open your Bible to um, Philippians 4, the, the last section. Paul's continuing what he started in verse 10. He began there to commend them for their gift. And this, this teaching then is concerning um, giving and the blessing that's involved in giving as we come to verse 15. Keep the, keep the idea in your mind, giving and the blessing that's involved in giving. I think that's what we're after here today. But let's, let's work through the passage a little bit. In verse 15, we get the information, we get information that the Philippian church, the Philippian church alone partnered with Paul in giving and receiving. He reminds them there of their beginning days in the gospel. When the church was brand new, he had just given them, he had just planted that church, they had just received the good news, and then in response to that, they gave to him. They gave him money toward his mission, toward his needs as he went out from them. So we're not talking about now, but at least 10 years prior to the writing of this, le of this letter to them. After planting the church in Philippi, Paul went out from them, and then you see it there, he went out from Macedonia. Eventually, at some time shortly thereafter, he landed in Corinth to bring the good news of Christ there. Now, I don't know if you remember last time, but I mentioned this verse, but listen to this, 2 Corinthians eleven nine. 9, it says, when I was with, present with you and in need, now he's talking to the Corinthians here, when I was present with you and in need, I did not burden anyone since the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So as we fit this all together, it's this new church, brand new church in Philippi that alone supported Paul at this time. He says then, a partnership was entered into in giving and receiving. You see that in 14 and 15. I think there's a technical sense to that phrasing, in giving and receiving. It might be so something that would be used in a business relationship or a report of, of receipts and expenditures. Part of the partnership spoken of here is literal. It's financial. Now, if you happen to start a business with other partners, other people, each partner invests in that business. No matter the number of partners, each one invests in the business in some literal way. They've given their unique talent or money toward that investment. They've taken on the risk and the hope of reward as they invested. And each partner, by the way, at least we would hope, they believe in the objective. They believe that this business should work. They invest because the vision makes sense. They believe it's worth investing into, don't they? That's what's going on here. This partnership, the Philippians and Paul investing together. But check this out. I think it goes beyond that formal relationship, that business sense, part of it, maybe the greater part of it, is spiritual. It's relational. The financial terms become metaphors for spiritual transactions, for relational things, long-term investments. They believe in, they are striving together towards the spreading of the gospel. Now, look at 16, verse 16 in your Bible. Apparently, the Philippians sent financial assistance to Paul even before he got out of Macedonia. So it's a little backwards here. Thessalonica is a town in Macedonia, just slightly southwest of Philippi, probably the next destination for Paul. Once he planted the church in Philippi and moved on, he moved to Thessalonica, and there they sent him a gift. 
that probably preceded the gift that was spoken of in 2 Corinthians. He wasn't even out of the province of Macedonia yet, and they sent him financial aid, and apparently more than once. You get the idea, though, then, that the Philippian church, they had their issues, didn't they? We've seen some of those, <clears throat> but they saw the value of generosity. They saw the value of generosity. More than just the broad idea of generosity, but financially partnering in a cause they believed in, investing, essentially investing in the things of God. I think I'm getting behind here on my slides. Verse 17, moving through, look at that verse. This is an important turning point. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, the gift that was given to him, but I seek the profit that increases to your account. He says, I don't seek the gift. I'm not saying I want more. My focus is not so much on what the finances have done for me, though that's important and I'm thankful. In all of this, Paul is saying, I focus on the reward, the profit. Literally, some of your translations, have, they bring through the literal word fruit that is added to your account because of your generosity. Well, for one, if there were any Philippians complaining that Paul was um, soliciting for more and more financial support, he puts this to rest quickly. I think Paul was also stressing that his, his partnership was more than just financial. It's a friendship that ties him to the church in Philippi. There's true love in their relationship, right? But look at that latter half of the verse. verse. A, a shift here is introduced in the philosophy of giving. Do you see the blessing that's introduced? Beyond just the business sense, the giving and the receiving, the transaction and the payment, Paul's motive is their life. His focus is their blessing. So their gift to meet his needs was a good thing, but it was a better thing that it opened their life to God's blessing. The fruit added to their account, that's the, like I said, that's the word, it should be literally fruit, but it, it needs to be understood in this context as an increase or a profit or even a reward. You, you might see that in your translations. That is added to their account, to their credit when they gave. Now, we talked a minute ago about a business. If you start a business, you choose to invest time and money into the startup. Some of you have done that. Maybe you even need a loan. You buy the equipment you need, the tools. You get education. Perhaps you rent a building. You, you might even hire employees. You decide to invest, to give to the venture. Now, not all businesses are successful, but your hope in giving to this venture is that you will profit in the end. At some point, you will make money. That's the idea. The return on your investment will be worth it. There's other ways to invest. Many of you have a retirement account of some kind, perhaps a 401k where your money's invested in the stock market. And it increases and grows as the stock market grows, right? Granted, the stock market doesn't fail. If you faithfully invest your money over years of time, there can be significant profit added to your account. Now, whether it's this or some other account, think about this for a minute. Say you started with $1,000 and then you invested regular, regularly over 35 years. For example, you invest $400 a month over 35 years and the interest and the growth on your account is 7% compounded annually. At the end of 35 years, you would end up with nearly $675,000. But check this out. If you had not invested that money, if you had stuck it under your mattress or put it in the coffee can in the backyard and buried it, you would have ended up with $169,000. Well, can you see the difference? If you had invested it wisely, at 7%, you'd 
you end up with $679,000 as opposed to $169,000 when there is no profit added to your account. Now, I'm not giving financial advice. Please be sure of that. But you get the idea. You see the difference. A profit is added to your account when you invest wisely. And I believe that's what we're seeing in verse 17. The emphasis so much is not so much on the amount given or that they've outgiven the Corinthians. Rather, it's on the profit that is added to their account, to the Philippians' account, to their lives, the blessing that they've opened themselves up to because of their wise investing, because of their generosity, faithfully giving over the years. Now we're going to come back to that and explore it some more, but look at verse 18. Paul expresses here that he's received everything that they have given. His need is met in full. It's here we learn that Epaphroditus was the one who brought him their most recent gift. And we saw earlier, possibly Epaphroditus was the one to bring the letter back to the church there in Philippi, the very letter we're working on here. There are three descriptors of their gift you see in verse 18, their generosity. First, it's a fragrant offering. This depicts something pleasing to God. When the Lord smelled the burnt offering of Noah after he and his family came safely through the ark or through the flood in the ark, it was seen as a pleasing odor. That's what it was called, a pleasing odor. Not so much the burnt flesh of the animal, but it, that it was offered in faith to God. You see the same pleasing odor language other times in the Old Testament as we're talking about a sacrifice given in obedience and faith. You even see the sacrificial death of Jesus as described as a pleasing odor in Ephesians 5 verse 2. That was the gift of the Philippians. Secondly, you see it there, their generosity was an acceptable sacrifice. Again, a very common concept for religious language in the day specifically of something given to god a sacrifice is something you've chosen to give up right you've given it in belief and in obedience this is more than just the sacrifice of sheep and of doves and of rams and bulls even in the old testament under the law when that was the thing to do as far as sacrifice godly people knew there was something more to sacrifice for example david says in psalm 51 the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, O God. What the Philippians had done was classified as an acceptable gift from the right heart. So you see the third one then in verse 18. Their sacrifice was pleasing to God. I think we've moved beyond the financial or the social value of the gift alone, and we're recognizing their generosity brought pleasure to God. It has spiritual significance. The Philippians pleased God and fulfilled His will by their giving. In, in Hebrews 13, verse 6, it says, Do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Three times, Paul has made the point, he's emphasized the value of their gift. If you look at verse 19, Paul then makes a statement many of us are familiar with. He says, and my God, by the way, this God that you've just pleased, you've offered your gifts to, the one you've just sacrificed for, he will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, in, excuse me, in glory in Christ Jesus. And then he concludes the section by giving all the glory to God alone forever and ever. Let it be so. Yes. My God will supply all your needs by his riches in glory as you are in Christ Jesus. You think about the Philippians' point of view. This would have been a point of comfort and encouragement to them. Now we don't know the details of where they, they were at financially, materially, but they... 
they'd given sacrificially most likely, and they had needs, even just simply material needs. Paul promises that God, even on behalf of Paul, would come through. He would meet their needs. And their gift was ultimately given to God. And God had an eye on that, didn't He? He had an eye on He smelled that gift. He knew about it, and He would respond in meeting their needs. Well, what does it mean that He would meet their needs? First, God would provide for their material needs. He wouldn't give up on them. He wouldn't overlook them. He'll provide for them. But it's not that alone. Think about the context of the whole letter that we've been looking at. What has been continually been promoted and impressed upon them up to this point? I think there's great concern for their spiritual needs. There was spiritual deficiency. There's a continual desire throughout the letter for God to meet their spiritual needs, help them in their growth. And I think by giving, by their wise generosity, the Philippians have opened the door for God's blessing. And much of that, here's the second one, is that God would work in them and renew them and change them. He would bring formation to their hearts. God would meet their needs. Now we're going to come back to that. Before we explore this idea, the blessing and wise generosity, take a look at the final greetings there in the last few verses of the chapter of the book. Paul wants his personal greetings to be passed on to everyone in the region of Philippi. And apparently those with him also heartily sent their greetings in verse 22. Many of these, by the way, almost all of them would not have known the Philippians. They never met. Some of them came from Caesar's household. They were servants or slaves of Caesar himself. But they shared greetings and as they shared in the family of God. And finally then, a benediction you see in the last phrase, the last verse, similar to many of Paul's letters, if not all of them, as he concludes. So we've noted that the Philippians gave a gift to assist Paul, assist him in his need, as well as help him in the mission. The gift was counted as a pleasing thing. It pleased God. It was a sacrifice. It was an offering to the Lord. Verse 17 reveals that it was more than just an offering or a gift, but it opened the door for the blessing to the giver. Following that in verse 19, God will supply all of their needs and I want to explore this idea of blessing in wise generosity. Blessing in wise generosity. I want to look at it backwards. Let's just look at each word beginning with generosity. Well, what do we mean by generosity? What do I mean by generosity? In this case, I'm especially talking about giving, specifically financially, but you could also sing al think along the lines of time talent, resources. Here's a, a story I came across. It's not personal to me, but uh, of a businessman who was a giver. A number of years ago, while serving at a Christian camp, I met Steve, who was part owner in a family business. Steve was one of the most generous people I'd ever met and gave many large donations to the camp. The family business went through some problems and Steve moved away to another state to start a new company from scratch. I visited him in his new offices and I knew his young company was struggling. During our meeting, he made a commitment to give another generous gift to the camp and I asked him why. He told me in his career, he'd made a lot of money and he'd lost a lot of money, but the only thing that remained constant was his giving to the Lord. So you see, Steve's business changed, the economy changed, but the giving stayed constant. Corey Ten Boom said, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. 
but whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. So we're talking about giving, giving to the Lord. Now, this is a huge topic, of course, and we're not going to cover it very well at all today. But in a broad sense, we understand from the passage today that giving is important for the believer. As a Christian, we are to be involved in giving. After all, has it not been given to us? Now, generosity speaks also to the nature of our giving. What is our heart in giving to the Lord? Sometimes we give for the wrong reasons. You can think about what those might be, what motivates our giving sometimes, but we can also be generous in our giving. We can give cheerfully. Listen to 2 Corinthians 6, or excuse me, 9, 6, and 7. Now, this verse, I'll read it in just a minute. This is Paul challenging the Corinthians with their giving. They needed some They needed some help, and in a couple of verses is when he mentions the Philippians, the verse I just read earlier, as examples of faithful giving. So it says this in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. The point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver, a cheerful giver, giving, holding loosely, valuing the things of God above our bank account. A man died and went to heaven. You find him at the pearly gates with St. Peter, who led him down the golden streets. They walked by mansions beautiful estates, until they came to the end of the road where they stopped in front of a little shack. Welcome home, says St. Peter. The man asked why he got such a a little simple hut when there were so many mansions and estates where he would have loved to have lived. St. Peter replied, well, we did the best we could with the money you sent ahead. (laughs) Now, of course, uh, the Theology is a little messed up on that one, but we recognize that what is in our heart is important. What our motives are as we make decisions about giving, it does matter. Are we generous? Are we cheerful? Many of you know the story of R.G. Letourneau. He was a Christian industrialist who dedicated his life to being a businessman for God. He was very successful, designing and developing his own line of earth-moving equipment. Letourneau was the maker of nearly 300 inventions and had hundreds of patents in his lifetime. As he succeeded financially, he increased his giving to the point where he was giving 90% of his income to the Lord's work. I shovel out the money, he said, and God shovels it back. But God has a bigger shovel. As giving people, we ought to be wise, wise generosity. Our giving, our generosity should be done with care and with thought, with reasoning, and we should have good biblical underpinnings as to why and where we give. Again, this is something that you can study out. The Bible actually has a lot to say about money, and it's not against money. There is help and instruction as we seek a wise course with our money and our resources. We have decisions to make, as you well know, on how we give, where we give, how much we give. First of all, as we discussed, our heart should be in the right place. Many of us need to work on that heart of generosity, don't we? Submitting to the Lord, trusting Him, and giving cheerfully. As we consider wise generosity, we recognize that there is great diversity amongst ourselves in how we give, how much we give, where we give, even why we give. And this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. We all need to consider carefully how we should give to the Lord. We have guidance in the scripture of righteous people who gave all they had, and this was considered good faith. 
We also have scripture that reminds us to provide for our families and think about our future and plan carefully as best we can. This is also a good thing. We need to study the scripture and seek the Lord with a heart for him, a heart for giving wisely and cheerfully. Now, wise generosity considers where to give. There are many good options, and there are plenty not so good options. When you give, when you are generous with your income, listen to this, when you give, you invest yourself into that cause. It's not just a matter of rote obedience or fulfilling a duty or paying another bill. You invest yourself into that thing. For example, if you buy stocks in the market, you buy them to earn a profit. That's the hope, right? And you buy based upon what you believe that that stock will do for you. When you buy that stock, you actually buy a piece of that company. You invest yourself into that company and in so doing, you believe that that investment will be a profitable one. In a similar way, you give, you invest in what you believe in. We are generous in the avenues that we believe promote the gospel, discipleship, evangelism, caring for the poor and the needy, etc., you name it. As you give, for example, as you give to your local church, for many of us, that's Bridgeport Chapel. It's not just another duty or being sure you get the bill paid or the tithe in or something. It's investing. It's not just that church over there that I give to, Bridgeport Chapel over there. It's your church. It's your body. I think you literally invest. You become part of. You have ownership of the things, things that we are about here at Bridgeport in investing. That's really a wonderful concept. It's more than just supporting in or believing in. It's becoming part of. It's your church. It's your vision, etc. There's more you could say about that. But it goes beyond giving to the local church, doesn't it? If you give to local missions or you give to foreign missions or social causes, Hope Pregnancy Center, you name it, you invest yourself into that cause and you become part of it. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we need to be wise in our giving, in our investing, because we become part of that. Well, let's look at the last word, which is really the first word, blessing. There's a blessing in wise generosity. The first blessing we see out of verse 19 is that our material needs will be cared for by God. Now, this looks very different from place to place, from time to time, from person to person. Just as with, with the Philippians, though, as we give to the Lord faithfully, we can be assured that He will provide for our needs. I know many of you have personal stories about how God cares for you and has cared, provided for the, the need when you needed it, right at the moment you needed it. For example, listen to this little bit about Bob. Bob first started giving 10% or more of his paycheck to God when he was in his mid-20s. At first, he was scared to start doing this, but as time went on, he discovered how faithful God could be in providing for his needs. He tells the story of when he was completely broke. He couldn't even afford to pur purchase the bus pass he needed to get back and forth to work. As he was sitting at his desk, feeling sorry for himself, the phone rang, and a woman in another department asked Bob if he knew anyone that needed a week's bus pass for bus number 47. Bob said, that's my bus number, and yes, I need a bus pass. He was amazed. Bob was learning to give to God first, and he was experiencing God as his faithful provider. He told everybody that God even knew his bus number. Well, God has a way of graciously providing for our material needs, doesn't he? He knows what we need even before we ask. But I think in verse 19 there, all of our needs, all of your needs, it goes beyond just material necessities and it covers everything. 
Someone has said it covers the full spectrum of God's care. And it includes, particularly, spiritual blessings. So as we give, as we are generous, as we invest ourselves, we open our life to God's many blessings. Now we're not talking about guaranteed health and wealth here. Please don't understand it to be that. That's not the point. That's not the truth of the passage. But we're talking about God's good care and God's shaping of our lives. Just as a potter cares and shapes a beautiful dish. God's care includes things like peace through tough times in life, the joy of the Lord in its fullness, and in so many ways He shapes us. We're talking about growth, about sanctification, development of Christian character. Remember Paul's prayer in verse 9 of chapter 1. One of the things he says there is that they would grow in and become more and more loving toward one another, that their love would grow. Giving, generosity, it produces spiritual growth in the giver. We experience God's good renewal, God's good transformation of our lives as we're willing to give to Him. This is part of the blessing of giving. Now think about that concept of investing. Remember verse 17, Paul seeks the profit or the increase in their account. As we give, as we are wisely generous, as we invest... We invest in things that promote the gospel, things that make disciples. We care for others in our midst. But you also are investing in yourself. You open your life to the blessing of God. That increase, that profit to your account comes as we are faithfully generous. We believe that God will, what, first care for us in material ways. But the increase is especially evident. That profit to our account, I think, is especially evident as God attends to our spiritual need, as He sanctifies us, as He changes us, as we grow in relationship with Him. Really, we're becoming the person that we were meant to become. The increase to your account in this sense is not limited to this world, is it? It's not limited to the 401k, the profit. The return on the investment in your life is forever. As we give, we open up our life to the blessing of God. And I think that's something the passage is trying to communicate to us. Mother Teresa visited Australia. A new recruit to the monastery in Australia was assigned to be her guide and her gopher during her stay. The young man was thrilled and excited at the prospect of being around Mother Teresa. He dreamed of how much he would learn from her and what they would talk about. But during her visit, although he was constantly near her, he never had the opportunity to say one word to Mother Teresa. There were always other people for her to meet. Finally, her tour was over and she was due to fly to New Guinea. At last, the friar had his opportunity to speak to Mother Teresa. He said to her, If I pay my own fare to New Guinea, can I sit next to you on the plane so I can talk to you and learn from you? Mother Teresa looked at him. Do you have enough money to pay your airfare to New Guinea? She asked. Oh, yes, he replied eagerly. Then give that money to the poor, she said. You'll learn more from that than anything I can tell you. As we give, we invest in ourselves. We will find God's blessing and we will grow. So keep in mind this statement. Be thoughtful about it and how how it is we can apply this statement. There is blessing in wise generosity. God will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Material and spiritual, there is increase. There is a return on investment. There is profit as we give to the Lord. 
Maybe it's money. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's resources. Maybe it's talent. Ultimately, it's your life, right? And you know the quote from Jim Elliott. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Andrew and team, if you guys would come up. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this chance to be in the last section of Philippians. Thank you for the, the need that the Philippians had that we can benefit from, the similar need in, in humanity. I'm just thankful for many who have gone before me, some of them, many of them here in this room who are generous and who have given, and even I can see the blessing in that in their lives. Thank you for being faithful to us. It's not a transactional thing. It's not like you're waiting to bless us before we give, but as we give our lives to you, as we trust you, you pour out your blessings even greater. Just pray that you'd apply this to our hearts as we need it. I know I need it. Thank you for your many, many merciful blessings to us. Even when we're not generous, even when my heart is not generous, when my motives are wrong, you're so good. And let us grow in generosity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up together for Abel, as you're able, and turn to page 597. Take my life and let it be. 597, and we will sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the Impulse of thy love, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee, swift and beautiful for thee. Verse 4. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Every power as thou shalt choose. Verse 6. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Thank you. We are dismissed.